Hi, I'm Isabel, and I'm the founder and firebrand of the Uprising Spark. Hi, I'm Lenora, and I'm the creator of The Bitchy Bookkeeper. Hi, I'm Kristen Tetsi, and I'm the author of The Age of the Child, and we are the three founding non-mothers of Child Free Girls. And with us today is Laura Carroll, who has done tons and tons of exhaustive research on pronatalism, child, childbearing, child, why kids are born, all of those things that she'll probably be able to explain a lot better than me. <laughs> and all of that led to uh, the baby matrix, which is available everywhere and should be taught uh, probably beginning in high school. I think. Yes, I'm uh, Laura Carroll. And uh, yes, I wrote uh, the book Families of Two, which is about child-free couples almost 20 years ago. And that uh, research led to me asking the question, why is that the child-free choice so hard to accept in the first place from society's perspective? And that led to research and publication of The Baby Matrix. And throughout that process, I ran across other experts, one of which is the conservationist Dave Foreman, who I then, uh, post-Baby Matrix, uh, did a book uh, called Man Swarm, <laughs> uh, and it's about overpopulation. So it's been an interesting uh, evolution of conversation, but it's all, all very related to pronatalism, for sure. Can I ask what it is, it's not the question like, who hurt you? I, when people say, you know, they, if you're really interested in child-free anything, or if you're researching this kind of thing, they might think, well, something must have happened in your childhood. That's not the question I'm asking. Um, the question I'm asking is what motivates you to do this? What motivated you from the beginning to, to put so much of your time and life into this topic? Well, with families of two, I had been at the time married about 10 years and everyone almost around me was starting to have children. And I went looking for a book Say, well, what, where are the long-term marriages that go the distance? I'm happily married, but it's been only 10 years. You know, who's been married 30 and they never had kids? You know, what was their marriage like? What was the glue? What did they, issues did they face? I didn't find that book out there anywhere. So I got the crazy idea that I would do it myself. <laughs> so I did. And at that time, the internet was really early in its evolution. So I put ads in newspapers, magazines, et cetera, and my answering machine believe it or not before voicemail etc it got so many messages you know it just blew its blew its top and my in basket on email uh, blew its top so I knew I was on to something so that's really where it started but, but the more I learned about it from people and from research that had been done um, I really thought the more provocative question was why is it such a big deal to begin with and that took me down a rabbit hole that I chose to call the baby matrix because it really is um, it's a there's so much illusion about what we've been taught to believe so once I started to grasp the things I even thought were to be true were really founded in beliefs that were pushed on us generations ago I just thought geez I've got to get people to understand that um, it is really indeed uh, a lot of stuff we believe about parenthood and reproduction all boils down to beliefs. And so I wanted to start talking about the truths that really, really drive it. So that's really what got my fire under my, my booty to do the baby matrix for sure. <laughs> um, what are some of the, in the baby matrix, you start out really early with, um, with the, the, things people would say or the beliefs they would espouse to try to get people to have kids and the reasons behind that, um, like why it was so important to a society that, that women have babies or that people reproduce in general. And I wonder if you could kind of briefly say how it all started, at least in terms, you know, in terms of where your research started and how it's different now, if it is, or like, why did we need to have babies then? Or why was it so you know, pushed then versus why it's pushed now. Sure. Um, I think I went back as far as the Augustus times, uh, you know, Roman times, when really to uh, have societies 
gain and keep their power, they needed to have more people. They needed to increase their population. And in those times, and even further out, even uh, after that, that having children back in those times was just was not a safe thing. You know, women could die, and uh, it's nothing like it was today. So, so because there were dangers around it, and people knew that, um, there had to be some romanticized myths or messaging to be created such that it would make getting pregnant and having children um, more appealing. And uh, I think we still, these, these myths that were created or messaging to inspire people to procreate still live with us today, even though now we're how many billion people on the planet? So, so the, over, the population gain argument is long over. So a lot of what I begin talking about that in the book, but as the discussion furthers, it's to get more specific about why did we go get so stuck on this particular assumption? Why do so many people believe some of these things still today, thousands of years later? You know, it's governments, it's church, it's some powerful influences, but it does go way, way back to when more people were needed to grow and gain power in, say, society, whether it be the political, cultural, or religious communities. Well, and that speaking of myths, then, I think there's a tiny myth in the Megan Daum Medium piece that came out. I don't know if it really, if it um, published today or yesterday, but I didn't see it until this morning. Um, in it, she argues that we shouldn't use the word child free anymore because it's offensive. And I understand why some people find it offensive. Um, but I, what I don't think she understands is that if a child is the last thing you want, and if this is society coming at you trying to, if, if everything in you since you've been born has led you to think I'm supposed to have a child and that's the last thing you want, right. it is kind of, it does kind of feel like a disease. And I'm not talking a fatal, awful, hair falling out disease. I'm talking about something that will destroy your life. And I think it's safe to say that just as it's safe for someone who desperately wants to children to say that their life will be permanently altered for the negative if they can't have children. Um, it's the exact same, I think it's the exact same strength of feeling. So I think if what you don't want is children, to say child free is pretty accurate. It's not meant to be offensive to anybody. Um, but one of the myths I think she puts into her piece is that we don't need a term at all because um, not having children isn't a stigma anymore. And I'm guessing she's got to be talking about um, urban areas or, you know, places where you have a big melting pot and there's not so much of a um, emphasis on traditional values and conservative values. And cultures are all mixed up. So it's not really, really heavy, at least in the, in the macro sense. But it does seem like overall, if you take the, the globe as a whole, seems like the pressure is still pretty there. The stigma is still there. And there are still a lot of people who have no idea having kids is a choice. And it seems like those who do, who somehow know it's a choice, like they can technically not have sex and technically not have a baby, but that doesn't mean the pressure isn't so heavy that they won't do it anyway. Right. And I feel like I didn't ask you a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I saw I saw Megan's piece uh, early yesterday, shortly after it uh, went up. And uh, or first of all, I know her personally, and I really respect her work and her books and her thinking. And she's a forward thinker. And she also, in her writings, um, she also, you know, she has a reputation of stirring the pot a little bit, um, which I think can be a very good thing because it's it's provoking discussion. Because here we are. Um, so. On the child-free word, I have several perspectives about that. On one hand, I agree with you, Kristen, that I think that the word still um, should, in many respects, be used. And a lot of people haven't really used it much. And it still gets muffled because there's child-free, there's child space Free. Then there's the word child free together and parents. And I, every year I do a trending piece on my website about child free trending. In the last two years, I've had to talk about the muddled use of this, the dash, no dash, and 
parents, you know, they're child free when they're not near their kids for three hours. You know, that's not what we're talking about. So, so many of the pieces I see it'd be easy for people that are new to, it, to just to get confused. Um, so the use is still in its evolution. Uh, and I think it's useful as a descriptor. Um, but yet there's the other part of me that uh, what I don't like, and I, I think I did a piece on this as far, maybe as far back as 2010 or 11, a post about what would be a word that's beyond child free because what bugs me about me about the word is the word child is in it and from a pronatalist standpoint it's still a child centric way of describing ourselves first so we're describing ourselves first by the child that we don't have even though it's by choice but because the word child is in it i would seek what is a word that would get at what we're after uh, from not reproducing by choice that would not have the word child in it and it's really hard to do <laughs> So until I find a word that I think would say it all I think I still end with I think the best word is child free no, altogether no dash no space <laughs> I have a question um, sure. You are vocal about being child free and your, your research of course your public publicly known the three of us are public about our choice not to have children and we are creating products and services that cater to that so mm -hmm. to anyone that says well just be silent about it you know just live your life peacefully child free why beat us over the head with this what is your thought on it obviously you've you've had a long career speaking about this topic but but how do you feel when someone says that well, on one hand, I do think that we've seen a lot of progress, certainly since I've been studying it for 20 years. With every generation, um, it does, uh, it's more talked about, more people are educated about it, they're more aware of what it means and why people do it and why it's actually just fine. Uh, we're normal people just making uh, a choice, you know, that's just different from what many people make. So that there's great, because there's so much been talked about, about it and thanks to the internet a lot has evolved over a short amount of time um, without it you know when I first started researching families of two I, when I would talk to people at these couples I would find they would say thank God someone finally wants to talk to us we feel like we feel like we're out on this island somewhere you know because we, nobody we know is like us and so the internet has allowed people to find each other learn from each other get our lifestyle choices out there and I, but I don't think it's time to stop talking about it altogether. So I think that there still is a way to go, ways to go. The stigma still is very alive in certain areas with certain people, and more people might think it's okay. But I have to say, when it gets close to home, when it's you know parents and their adult children are making that particular choice, uh, it can still be an exercise in trying to ferret through what kind of pressure those parents are going to give directly or indirectly because socially and culturally it's still so powerful that we think it's what we're supposed to do. So we're still on the road to uh, challenging, I think the bigger picture is challenging pronatalism and how the child-free choice and the lack of acceptance in it still fits into that that larger conversation. So in that lens, I still think We've got a lot to talk about, and it and to me personally, until somebody gives me a better word, I think the best word to keep using is child free. And you know, I've experimented with a number of words, but you know, none of them quite fit. And the word started to be used, by the way, in the 70s in a textbook. So somebody thought it was a, a descriptor that's worth you know using as a delineation between certain groups and others so uh, i know it's come around more popularly um in, you know in recent years but um that's the first i saw of it and that's you know, you know that's what 40 years ago or so is child free in the dictionary that's a good question well i know certainly it's in, on wikipedia yeah uh, that'd be <laughs> Uh, I'd, be, you'd be, I'd be curious to look it up in different dictionaries to see yeah. how they spell it and how they uh, define certain spellings. So, it it just occurred to me. Up. I never thought to check, but yeah. Yeah. Good question. Now, regarding that um, article that we were just talking about, 
yeah. there's one thing that really bothered me about, oh, there are many things, but I'm just going to focus yeah. on one. And yeah. she, she said, um, you have to stop saying it, like stop bragging about it. Right. And the reason it bothered me is because when I use the word child free, I'm not bragging. It's just something that I identify with. And coming from a culture that is completely different than the right. culture in the States or any other developed country, being able to identify as child free is actually very important to me. Because if you guys feel in the States, in your culture, pressure, let me tell you, here it's four times harder, you know? And so being yeah. able to stand up and um, say proudly I'm child free in, in this, in Latin American, family centered, uh, extremely religious society, for me, that is how I, I identify. So it's not about bragging. I think she saw it from like her perspective, you know, in the States, developed country, but the word child free is now global. And if you actually look at, if you find the accounts on Instagram or Facebook of child free people in Latin America, we use the words, we use the anglicism, we say child free Mexico or child free Colombia or child free wherever. True. Right. The word bragging, I know I, I had to think about that and why she chose that word, because I think in part what I recall when I was reading it is she's speaking to maybe how now we're seeing, you know, products and T-shirts and coffee cups and these various capitalistic ways to commodify it. Um, and maybe she's criticizing that in part, that we don't have to, like, get all the accoutrement around us, you know, maybe, you know, maybe using the, the, the language is... Uh, one thing, but making it kind of a business, um, which I don't, I don't, I can't say it's a big business, but there sure is a lot of, there's a lot more products out there than there ever used to be. Um, so I think, and I'm personally, I don't have a problem with it, but I, I do think that she, she is coming from a perspective that um, the more we talk about it, how, is it really helping us? And I would say overall, in the context of education and exposure, I'd say the answer is yes. So um, I, I get where she's going with it. Um, and I think, as I think I read in somebody's comment online or on Twitter, that she may be just a little bit of ahead of herself uh, in, in, in the vision. And, it, and, you know, when I think of Megan, I can think of her that way, too, because she does think forward and she's a very thoughtful person. Um, so. I'll be curious to see if she stops using it in her writing. <laughs> 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 Comments and everything about her article. We'll see what she does next or what she thinks next. I know on my Facebook, Families of Two Facebook page, it inspired a lot of conversation. So not, not, not just in my area either, and online everywhere. So, and that too could be part of uh, you know, what Medium wants her to do is like stir the pot and get people talking about it. So that could be another something. I think the other problem with calling it bragging and even the, the problem with having a problem with the commodity oh that the products, <laughs> um, it seems to me like something about the way you just said it made me think of people who say, oh, look at those two gay people holding hands, flaunting their relationship mm -hmm. or, you know, or people who have a problem with gay pride parades because this is people um, being happy in a choice that has been very unpopular for a very long time. Yeah. And to stop talking about something, whatever the reason, is kind of synonymous with silencing the conversation. Um, and you don't see any parents being silent about anything their kids are doing, um, from sure. diaper <laughs> products to yeah. Food items yeah. eaten to cheese thrown on their face. That's hilarious. Um, if they're teenagers, it's really funny. <laughs> There's one where a teenager gets a slice of cheese thrown on his face. It's so funny. Um, but is that bragging for them to show us their children all the time and show us their prom dresses and their first days of school? I, I don't, I've never thought of it as bragging. I've never particularly been annoyed by it. Um, the only thing I've ever wondered about is kids too young to give proper consent being all over the internet but I think it's if you're just expressing joy in a life path that you've chosen and I'm still very happy I don't think about it all the time I don't go around, walk around all day thinking I'm child free <laughs> but, 
but I do have moments when I see families or, or, you know, someone walking with kids and I, I don't have any negative thoughts toward them, but every now and then I do think, I, I can't believe I got out of it. You know, it's like getting out of a big, huge exam that I'm not prepared for, or just really don't want to take because it's chemistry or something. But I do still feel like I've escaped something that, that I maybe didn't know I could. And it's still very exhilarating. Um, so it's not ragging and the commodifying it is not, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, anyone's going to sell anything. And the more it's out there, the more people see it, the more someone who doesn't know about it is like, oh, so that's a choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it definitely, I think, helps uh, messaging get out there and have people ask questions. And uh, for me, if it, if it helps young people have an aha that you could actually not do it, um, the sooner that comes in their life, I think the better. Uh, and, you know, that could come as early as, in, in my mind, in grade school. You know, the kids are they're, they're old enough to learn about a lot of stuff when you say you're eight years old. Um, and to see what their parents chose, is, it was a choice, I think, to, the earlier the better, because that will just put a, you know, big pinhole in the big balloon of, you know, pronatalism earlier rather than wait to get all these messages so ingrained in their heads that they spend half their life, life unraveling them to find out what it is they really want to do. And in the end, it could mean they have one kid or two kids. You know, Hopefully it's not more than two kids, but that's another topic. <laughs> so, you know, to help them know, begin to know themselves without, without all that messaging, uh, I still think there's plenty to deal with there. So there again, back to medium piece, I think it in part could come from the perspective that we've come a long ways and now we maybe we don't have to really talk about it that much. And uh, from what I see out there, that is true in part, but it's not true in a lot of different places. Even look at the filmmakers out there, you know, Maxine Trump and Teresa Schechter, they're doing these films and when they're talking to people all over the place, they're having a heck of a time. These are people that still have to do a lot kinds of pressures and you know mindsets and you know so there's a lot still that needs to be broken through I think socially and culturally. Absolutely um, I have a question personally for you how has diving into this topic and throughout your career how has it in enriched you personally like just in your own decisions in your own life your day-to-day -day life because um, I know the three of us have, have spoken about how being open and even doing this collaboration has really added a lot to our lives and connecting with a lot of humanity, whether it's child free or otherwise. And it's personally really, really changed the course of my life this last year. So for you, how has it, how has it added to your life being public about it and, and creating things that younger generations can use? That's precisely how it's really added to it. Cause I, I was sure pretty much back as a teen. I, and I knew that that's when I grew up, I didn't really want to have parenthood be the central focus of my life. And for a while, my parents didn't believe me. Well, maybe I think my mother actually probably believed me more than my dad. But um, then as I got older, um, it became clear as I got married that it wasn't going to happen. My husband believed me that I wasn't going to change my mind. And he was cool with that. He could go really either way. And that's true. He really could have gone either way. Um, and so when I went looking for couples who were making the same choice, little did I really realize that I was going to open the end up opening the eyes of a lot of people to really let them see that they really could make that choice. And here's a lot of people in the tributaries of society that have made that choice and they have fantastic lives and they're very normal people. So I knew I could, I could help people see a bigger picture of what might be possible in their lives and then as I got dug deeper into, well, why do we believe this stuff anyway? Why do we hold, like, we don't want to have kids. Why do we, you know, I know I did. I had to look at myself and go, is there something that I'm missing about myself? It's like that I don't really want them. I don't have that gene or what is that? Little did I know we'd find out there is no maternal instinct. That's huge. It's huge. So some of these revelations with the research is just you have to pass it on. You have to help, you know, as I, I think the subtitle of the baby makers is, you know, free your mind. And that's one reason I called it the baby makers, because you've got to get past some of these things that are really just beliefs. That, so that um, I feel what's helped been so 
gratifying is I've, I know I've helped a lot of people get closer to what they really want and to feel completely fine about that when it comes to their reproductive lives. And let's face it, that is a big factor in the decisions we make in our lives. So is it yes or is it no? If it's yes, how many? It's huge. So to help people get clearer about that, um, just from what I've learned, has been you know, really gratifying. And then I continue to learn. Maybe Matrix led me to Dave Foreman and it blew my mind to learn about overpopulation and that it really is a crisis. And so that just you know, got me going on that. And it, it's, it's not so unrelated. I speak to it in the book, too, in one, one whole chapter about how it, too, is a it's a it's one of the dangers of pronatalism is that we, we allow overpopulation to happen and to continue because we just continue to think we're supposed to have kids and that's normal. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's been a great journey, and, and it takes one step leads to another, which is even more you know, interesting and fulfilling for me. On that note, what do you think about antinatalism? Oh, antinatalism? Well, interestingly, um, so I chair the selection panel of the International Child Free Day uh, event every year, and we get nominations from all over the world or a child-free person of the year and child-free group of the year. And this year, the panel selected child-free India, which they are a group of antinatalists. And they are being heard in overpopulated India. They're doing some really bold things. So I credit them. I think that um, it's an ideology that uh, if it resonates for you, go for it. Um, I think some of the tenants are worthy of looking at where part of it is to alleviate suffering of humans. To, if, as soon as you bring a human into the world, you are, you, are, you are going to subject that human being to suffering. And in today's world, you're going to subject that human being to quite a lot of suffering, depending on where they are born and what their life uh, from having parents who shouldn't have had them to begin with, to being in a underdeveloped country, and, you know, whatever the factors are. So I think it's an ideology that's worth looking at. Uh, my concern, though, is I don't want uh, the messaging out there to have it be that just because we are child free, it means it means or it's treated as synonymous to antinatalism, because there's a lot of people who are child free, and they are not antinatalists. They don't care, or it's not of interest to them. The suffering, okay, I get it, but not really what's, you know, yanking my decision process of not having kids. But then there are people who are child free that are antinatalists. They're antinatalists, and then they make, they make the choice not to have kids because it's consistent. But having said that, there are parents who are antinatalists. <laughs> Maybe they weren't when they had kids, but they are now. <laughs> so, so I think it's, uh, in today's world, I think it's an ideology that's something it's worth knowing about and really thinking about yourself to see where you square up with it and where it makes sense and where it needs to be talked about in the, the great grander scheme, scheme of things. I have more I have more comments than questions. I, for Go me, for I, it. Yeah, let's do I it. just feel like listening to... Like you're bringing in your your expertise, your perspective inside. I'm just going the child free conversation, whether it's by circumstance, by choice, pronatalist, pro, uh, not prenatalist, but you know, pro life, <laughs> pro choice. I feel like the conversation is just getting started, and maybe because I am new in in voicing my my opinion, my thought, my experience. But I I speak with a lot of like I get a lot of DMs from the younger generations, like 19 year olds, like girls in college. And actually, most of the most of them American. Like I, I don't have a lot of uh, Canadian viewership, even though I'm, I live in Canada. But they are. It's exciting to speak with them because they are now going. Oh well, I'm in college, and they're debating whether or not to even have sex and and uh, dating and all that stuff. And I was very late to the sex game. Like I was in my mid twenties when I started, just because my thing was I wanted to be in control. I didn't want kids, so that really ruled a lot of my decision making. So I'm having these conversations with younger women who are in those, those early stages and they're just starting to realize that they have a choice. So for me, I'm going, this conversation is far from over. And I think how we can evolve in, in bringing the conversation, how we can talk about it. Um, I am all for products, obviously, because I've created one, you know, that people, <laughs> 
that people can use in the privacy of their own home and figure out their own stuff. Like I don't even have to be there or anything. Right. Like I, I just feel like this conversation just again, adds to the level of passion that I feel about, about just sharing, not, not lecturing, not trying to convince one way or the other, but like, look, this is a, a life, a choice that I made. Here's where it's taken me so far. Here's who I've met. This is the opportunities that have arisen because of it. Like, I just feel that that there is so much. And whether we use the term child-free in 10 years or not, like, you know, I mean, it's it's a label. But this is our lives, right? And the four of us here, like, we have made these decisions. These are our lives. And, and again, however we label it, whatever our reasoning is, it's important. And I just, I'm a talker, so I'm all for the conversation, right? And I, I just feel my comment is that this excites me because I think there's so much more to go. And it's nice to have someone like yourself who has been doing this for so long and has seen so much evolution, you know, for those of us who are new to the game in, in speaking publicly about it. Like, it's just, you know, you've created such a great foundation, even though you're only 36, you know? <laughs> hey, I like that number. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's, it, that's my point is that I that's my comment is that I feel there's a long way to go and it's an exciting journey as to where it can go in the future well I would say that uh, after I published families of two and it was really well received which to me that was a shocker anyway like being on national tv in the year 2000 talking about this it was coming from way out of left field so I thought I was going to be hammered and on TV and stuff, I, I wasn't. Now, on the radio, that was another thing, talk radio, et cetera. But just talking about it uh, was, uh, was really new. But I started getting a lot of emails and communications from people younger than me. And what should I do about my parents? Blah, 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 you know? And uh, so I created LaVeeChildFree.com. And that was in 2009. And so I felt the same, that the conversation was just in its infancy, really, online, um, besides reading about, you know, journal studies and stuff. Nobody was really talking about it in a popular fashion. So that's what inspired me to start that website and to grow it and to create, hopefully create a larger conversation. So I think things have just started, but it's, you know, since for 20 years, things have been rumbling. And I still think, again, it's, it's largely due to the digital revolution and the exposure of this whole topic has happened so fast compared to before. So we'll move forward with it. And, and there's more to talk about. Um, and I hope it gets to the larger behemoth of pronatalist thought, because that's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where minds are really going to change, not just about not having kids, but about a whole bunch of stuff that involves parents and everybody. So to me, that's the bigger game. So. One thing I wondered is what you see as the biggest um, pronatalist myth circulating today, um, especially now that we have attempted overturns of Roe v. Wade and you know, and I don't know if it's still happening, but pharmacists who will decide that it's against their religion to give you your prescribed birth control. Um, we have all these efforts to not give women the choice. And so with that, there must be some messaging in there somewhere. And I just wondered if you had noticed that or, or if there's been a, um, a fairly steady myth that a lot of people fall victim to or maybe not fall victim to, but believe and let that guide their decision to have children um, more than giving it careful consideration and thinking, okay, these are the pros, these are the cons. Am I ready for the cons? Well, certainly patriarchal thought and dominance uh, still is a powerful force in the world. It's in the medical community. It's in the political realm. Um, so that is certainly a driver. And, I don't even, there aren't even really any assumptions behind that other than to say it's patriarchy and it's been with us for a long time. And we're slowly, we were, at least slowly, I think, moving past it. But in the current political environment and, and judicial environment, um, it's pretty scary stuff. It's a big step, I, I think, step backwards if we continue on this, you know, leadership journey um, that we're on. But I think one of the pronatalist assumptions, I think it's one I talked to 
fairly early on in the baby matrix is what I call the normality assumption. And in there is all the discussion that I think in the end people do see it as a choice more, but they still kind of deep inside ask themselves, is there something wrong with me that I don't want this? Am I sure there's nothing wrong? <laughs> am I really like a woman? Am, am, I, do, am I really like an immature adult? Whatever the, that means. Uh, I think because that's a core sense of your being, how you see yourself, your confidence, your esteem, to get past that there is absolutely nothing wrong with you. In fact, you know, maternal stuff is just this other thing that's been put on us. Um, and yes, we do have biological processes that, that create desires in us, but all the research says it happens after the baby's born, not before. So these are, I think those are what I get, I think the most that are most personal to people that contact me and have over the years, or even in groups since the book has been published, it's, it's um, feeling okay from an internal perspective, because if, if I get there, moving through the other pronalis assumptions becomes almost more of an academic exercise and looking at the truth behind facts. But that's the one that um, is most personal. So I think that's the one that um, in, in all of what you're doing and what good things are, that are being done out there to just get this trial-free messaging out there is if we can more uh, just treat it as we're very normal, it's a normal choice, it's just as normal as having children, you know, that because that's the reality. And that's, I think, what more people just need to hear and uh, see modeled for them. Yeah, I completely agree. And this is something that has always been mind-blowing to us. And we have discussed this several times with Kristen and Lenora, and it is that most child-free women didn't know they have a choice. It's, do you, like, do you have... Can you imagine like the pressure that you're feeling from society, your family, your values, your culture, people, your peers, that you don't yeah. know that it's a choice? That's crazy. Right. And the moment you realize it is, it's such a huge aha, and it goes against what society tells us. You have to go, is that, really, is that true? <laughs> yeah. Again and again to go, no, really, it is. I swear it is. Yeah. It's so powerfully, the message is so much the opposite, you know, and, and everywhere. I mean, where you live, I'm sure, you know, country by country. And Absolutely. In the United States and developed countries, it's, it's right there in yeah. many families, many areas. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. Yeah. So. In, my, in my particular case, my personal case, when I realized that I had the choice, it, I felt liberated. I felt like a weight just got off my shoulder. I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> I can really do this. I don't have to do what people around me are telling me that I have to do. And that's, I think, the message that we want to get out there is not don't have kids. I mean, if you want to have them because you've thought about having them and you have made the choice consciously for whatever reason, then yeah. do it. But, yeah. if, you know, you don't have to, basically. Maybe that's why it became child free because when you realize that the weight is lifted, this whole, the feeling, tense of that is you do feel freer there is a certain yeah. inner freedom that you feel and that, and that becomes to be very real inside that was exactly my feeling that's why i pref i like the term because it's i like kids you know i have nothing against children i always say i just don't want them in my living space but you know i i like kids i'm not a i'm not a anti-natalist at all but the, the freedom it's i am all about freedom it's top priority for me is to have freedom so and to enjoy it as well so child free for me is is just that is it's freedom it has nothing to do with hating kids and i know there's a long way to go with the label and with uh, people understanding if they want to understand or open-minded enough to understand this perspective you know which is another reason why i think it's so good to share the stories you know just just to share the experience that that's it that is powerful in itself you know, whenever you meet somebody else that, that realized they did not want to have kids, whatever the outcome of their life is, just having that conversation is awesome. You know, I think that's, you know, again, the three of us are chats and even creating this, but just discussing, we, we throw in a lot of our own experiences and we learn more about each other as we're doing this because, you know, we have, didn't know each other before. So as we're creating this and sharing pieces of our journey just randomly, or maybe it's just me randomly sharing my stuff. <laughs> I don't 
it's like, guess what? <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, it's, it's powerful and it's, it's, it's fun. You know, that's, so for me, child free, just, there's a huge fun element about it that I want people who are, you know, to experience the possibility of, of having that feeling as well. Laura, you said that you tried to come up with, you, you experimented or, or thought about different words to use besides child free. Do you remember what any of them are? Well, one you see out there uh, sometimes, I think it's nulli para, L-U-N-U-L-L-I-P-A, forgive me, P-A-R-A, something like that. And I think Jody Day at one time, she and I riffed on that. And she would go, you know, nulli, poly, how could we riff on that word? No. Then uh, one I, I, I think I just posted, I tweeted this the other day that, um, a word I like, and it's the name of an Italian film about women that don't have kids, made by these filmmakers. I hope it comes to the States someday. It's a fabulous film. But the name of it's called Luna Digas. Mm -hmm. And it's um, what shepherds would call sheep who didn't reproduce. Oh. And so it doesn't get into the choice thing, which so that doesn't really qualify it per se but it's a word that I went you know it rolls off the tongue it's something fun to say you know it's it's, it's it's not it's not um it's it's Serbian it's 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 derivative of a language that you know people won't know about as much so it's kind of it sounds cool but I wanted to try to be creative about it but then I thought okay yeah um I am Luna Digas <laughs> No, next. Okay, we're back to child free. So I tried, and then I try to use words that don't have the word child in it, and it's really hard. So it bugs me. Sometimes we have to describe ourselves by what we're not. Really, do we? You know, do we have to do that? How could we do it another way that's creative, beautiful, um, that still gets the, the point across? Maybe I wonder if this is the thing about wanting to take away the positive acts. acts positive aspect of being child free because I'm very much like let's let's have a positive vibe I'm, I'm very uh it means something to me to, to bring a positive spin on not spin on the message but but just to be positive right um and maybe not one speaking to about one person or article in particular but maybe there is the assumption like you know what my child child free experience is not a pleasant one so I don't want, you know, I want to have a negative spin on it. Maybe somebody's thinking that way and that child free just sounds too happy, you know, because maybe some people do want to kind of quietly w warn others that, you know, like we enjoyed our life, but really we didn't because maybe they're, you know, not everyone, not all child free experiences are the same. It's impossible, right? Right. Some of us have a great experience with it. Our choice, we don't regret it. We are we are happy with the outcomes of our lives. But then there are other child-free that aren't. And they're not childless. They chose not to have kids, but it may be just whatever they were expecting to feel, it didn't happen for what other reasons. Like, we can't blame it on not having kids. But, you know, maybe, maybe the positive vibe offends people who don't have that experience. To me, what makes me think of is, Underneath that is, well, uh, you're supposed to not be completely positive and happy if you don't have kids. Why? Because we're all supposed to have them. Normal people have them. So in there somewhere is like, well, maybe we're not quite normal, which is, you know, bull. So it's interesting to just listen, listen to the language and the positiveness and go, well, what assumption is underneath that assumption, which is under, underneath that assumption? And I guarantee it, it goes down to something that's pronatalist related at its bedrock. So un until I think we get past that, um, it's just as normal not to have them as, as it is to have them, some people are not going to. Maybe she's right. Maybe if we got to that place, maybe we wouldn't have to use the positive word of child free. Uh, maybe. But I think we're all saying that we still think we have a little ways to go. Not there. Laura, thank you for being here. Everybody out there, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I learned a lot. I think we all did. Um, I don't know if Laura did, but the rest of us probably did. <laughs> I always um, do. <laughs> do. you have any opinions about anything? Like maybe you have a really great uh, replacement word for child free. Um, 
or if you want to share an opinion or if you want to argue something or ask a question, please um, email us at childfreegirls at gmail.com or comment on our Instagram feed or our Twitter tweets. Uh, <laughs> we're findable. We're really easy. We're, and we're also on Facebook. It's just at Child Free Girls. You can find us anywhere. Um, thank you for watching and see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>